Hello, Reed. Hello. All right, and our first presenter today will be Reed Smith from the Anchorage Opera. Hi. Good evening. So just when I thought an Alaskan adventure was not in my future, I received a phone call offering me a job as the general director of Anchorage Opera. This was June 27, 2014. I accepted the position and frantically took steps to sort out just how my wife, our dog Elsa, and I were going to deal with our house in Binghamton, New York, and get ourselves and our household to Anchorage before September 1st. This was not an easy task. After all, one accumulates a lot of stuff in a four bedroom house after living in it for 14 years. Since our Bernese mountain dog is a sensitive soul, we decided flying was not an option for us. So after packing and sending off a container with our household and settling affairs as best we could in Binghamton, we piled in our car with a friend and drove the 4,300 miles to Anchorage in six days, arriving on August 24th. Now, here's where my story begins to relate to our experience with the cost of health insurance in Alaska. On the very day we arrived in Anchorage, we were called into the opera offices by the office manager who was going to leave the next day to take her son to off to college for a week. My wife, Judy Berry, by this time had become engaged as the marketing and development director of Anchorage Opera, so she came with me to the office. Upon arriving at the office, we were informed that the company was insolvent. Unable to meet payroll, they are moving expenses, or the tens of thousands of dollars owed from the previous season. Obviously, this was a company that was not in a position to offer health and dental insurance as an employee benefit. We had done some research on the plans offered on the individual market in Alaska and realized that it would be less expensive if we went on COBRA through our previous employer. Anchorage Opera eventually agreed to increase our compensation to cover approximately 80% of that monthly premium. This turned out to be a very wise move because New York State allows COBRA to last for three full years, while most states only allow 18 months. I won't go into the details of what happened financially at Anchorage Opera in the months and years after we arrived here, but suffice it to say that with hard work from both the staff and board, as well as tremendous support from the community, the company has finished the last three seasons in the black and as of January 1st, 2017, is free of debt. But remember, there were three years of COBRA and the end date for that was August 31st, 2017. What to do? Essentially, there were two options the company considered. One was to offer a company plan and the other was for my wife and I to find coverage on our own. A company plan meant that the company would have to offer health insurance, not only to us, but to a third employee as well, because that employee was of the same classification. The cost of the two options was virtually the same, but for a company that had been plagued with severe cash flow issues in the past, the idea of having to meet a hefty insurance premium every month was a non-starter. So my search for health and dental insurance for my wife and me began in December 2016. It was important to us to obtain coverage similar to what we had on COBRA, which was classified as a gold plan. I was shocked to find at the time there were no gold plans offered in Alaska, but that wasn't the half of it. The closest plan available was going to be more than three times the cost in premium alone, not to mention 20% coinsurance versus none on COBRA and a much higher deductible. Premiums alone for health and dental would run us $5,000 a month. That's $60,000 a year. So I told the board that my wife and I wouldn't be able to cover the cost, even if they agreed to pay 80% of it. And as general director, I couldn't see how they would be able to cover the 80% anyway, given the Alaska recession. 
Sadly, we informed them of our intention to resign and leave Alaska after the season ended on June 30th, 2017. Not wanting to lose us as employees, the board asked me to search for another option. I had heard of other organizations with employees who worked remotely for stretches of time, so I decided to see if that would be a possibility. I researched buying health and dental insurance in New York since we still owned our house in Binghamton and the tenant was set to move out by the end of July 2017. For about $200 more a month than COBRA, we would be able to purchase the same gold plan in New York. The catch was the primary person on the plan had to satisfy the residency requirement of both being domiciled in New York and being physically present in the state 183 days a year. In addition, there would be significant technological costs associated with allowing us to efficiently work remotely. The board agreed to our working remotely and provided some funds to cover part of the technological costs. My wife and I downsized from renting a three bedroom house in Anchorage to a one bedroom furnished apartment and we moved our household back to Binghamton, New York. As a side note, just as our potato was leaving Anchorage, it was announced that health insurance premiums in Alaska were to drop by 20% as of January 1st, 2018. However, even with this drop, it still made sense for us to do what we have done to minimize the cost of health insurance. My wife, as the primary on the insurance, is now officially a resident of New York, as is our dog, Elsa. I am still a resident of Alaska, but I do spend a fair amount of time in New York working remotely for Anchorage Op. So far, this is, uh, arrangement is functioning with few problems. It is interesting to note that when applying for coverage in Alaska, you are asked the ages of the persons to be covered. While in New York, you are not. If my wife and I were 20 years younger, the premium in Alaska would be more than 50% less than it is now. I won't pretend that our current situation is ideal. We have endured hardships and feel as though we have been prevented from having a future in Alaska. It is also bad for Alaska. There is one less dog in and one less resident of Anchorage. Money earned in Alaska that was spent in Alaska is now being spent in New York. That's my story. Thanks for listening. stick around, but um, we want to thank him for his story. Um, one story of how high health care costs have actually moved someone out of the state. So our next speaker will be Emily. about three years ago in 2014. And about three years ago, I uh, was a healthcare policy professional working my way up the state ladder. I was working towards my master's degree in public health through the University of Anchorage. I was newly married, I was 31 years old, and I was excited about the future. And then about a week before Christmas, I found out that I had cancer. And in what felt like an like a overnight twist of fate, I suddenly went from healthcare policy professional to unemployed cancer patient. And I would like to say that I uh, handled the transition gracefully, but there were moments when I did not. I clearly remember coming out of my uh, surgery from my first procedure, being wheeled out of the operating room on the gurney, and there was an oxygen mask in my face, and I was just struggling against the drugs, and, and it was really important that I communicate something to my oncologist. And I could see him walking next to me on the bed, and I was, I was saying a phrase over and over and over again, and it was so important for him to hear this. And I remember him leaning over and lifting the oxygen mask off my face 
And I, what I was saying is, I don't belong here. You made a mistake. I don't belong here. I do not belong here. You made a mistake. I don't belong here. And of course, he puts the mask on and walk off and I, you know, dozed off. You know, but I did belong there because disease, illness, and injury impacts all of us at one point or another in our life. No one will make it out of this world without becoming a healthcare patient. And so I decided that if I was gonna be an unemployed cancer patient, I was gonna be the best damn unemployed cancer patient that there was. And I was gonna use all of my skills, knowledge, and abilities, which were considerable, to navigate the hell out of the system. And you know what, I did. When I went met with my radiation oncologist, I showed up with about two inches of peer reviewed journal, journal articles and a set of guidelines that I explained to him I thought was how my treatment should be directed. I later found out that he had written those guidelines. <laughs> <laughs> I also took a perverse lead in checking my healthcare claims every single day. And I was especially satisfied to see the difference between bill charges and paid charges for each one of my chemo infusions. And so I did a really great job of being an unemployed cancer patient. And I made it through the cut, burn, and poison scheme of my scheme of my treatment, which you know you may be more familiar with surgery, chemo, and radiation. Um, it, and honestly, I came out of the other side, um, you know, not I mean worse for the wear, but significantly better than other people I met. But even with all of my knowledge and abilities, I still ran into problems. I ended up in the, in the emergency room at 10 o'clock at night more times than I wanted to because I wasn't able to receive the care that I needed or I didn't realize I needed certain care during Monday through Friday working hours. My body doesn't work like that. Apparently Friday at 10 o'clock is when things go haywire. Um, I also ended up with balanced bills from providers, which is kind of incredible because I went out of my way to make sure that I always went to a network provider. And so as I, you know, six months later, as I finished up my treatment, I took stock of what I had been through, I started interacting with other ca cancer patients and survivors, you know, and I, I truly realized how exceptionally great my experience was compared to others. And so when I came back to work for the state, which is about a year ago, I came back with a personal mission to basically do what I can to make the system better. Because even at its best, which for me, the system was at its best, it is confusing, difficult, complex, and fragmented. It does some things exceptionally well. It healed me. And I am forever grateful for the providers, the technology, and the health insurance plans that allow me to think about my future in terms of decades and not months or years. That's amazing. But that same system is deeply flawed, and there are consequences to those flaws. And now I find myself back at the state looking at the system, looking at the system and the financial consequences of our system from the other end. And quite frankly, it's both inspiring and it's scary. It's inspiring because I received exceptional care. It's inspiring because I know other cancer patients that can get care in their hometown in, in a way that they could not 5, 10, 15, or even 20 years ago. But it's scary because I know just how much the system costs, and I don't know how we're going to be able to sustain it. Two months ago, the Department of Administration completed a series of reports evaluating the feasibility of establishing a healthcare authority here in Alaska. I'm not gonna go into the details of those reports, but there were some important findings to just understand the magnitude of uh, public spend on healthcare in the state. The reports estimated that in 2016, about 340,000 individuals were covered by, uh, by public health benefits. So those provided by the state through Medicaid, through the retiree plans, uh, state of Alaska employees, school districts, political subdivisions, municipalities, university, corporations. I could throw in some more words there and you probably wouldn't pick up on any difference. But the point is you have, a, you have hundreds of thousands of people that are covered by public benefits in the state. And in 2016, the cost to provide those benefits was over three and a half billion dollars. So there's a significant amount of money that the state and public payers are investing into the system right now. The report also found that the cost of those benefits was 60% higher than the national average um, and that those costs were growing faster. So not only are we paying more, but what we're paying is increasing faster than what you see down south. And so from a public payer, so, and so the fiscal growth we're experiencing can kind of be hard to see when you try to look at it from a systems perspective. But one area, and, and the consequences to that growth can kind of be hard to see, but one area um, where that consequence is relatively easy to see is in the growth of healthcare spending within the state's budget. In fiscal year 17, the state spent approximately 1.3 billion in general funds on healthcare-related services. 
That accounts for about 23% of state general funds within the budget. If healthcare costs continue to increase at 5% a year, that, that in 10 years, that amount will grow from 23% to 32%. And the consequence of that growth is that those dollars are not available to be put towards other resources. And at a time when the state had more money and our budgets were bigger, that consequence was not as severe as it is today. But today, we're dealing with a $3.2 billion deficit next year. And at the state level, we're having to make some really hard choices, really difficult choices about what we fund and how we come up with the money to fund it. And so now that growth in healthcare cost and the consequences of that growth are becoming even more important because they're making our choices even harder. And so when I think about the consequence of healthcare growth from our system, I really think about its impact on our choices. To me, it becomes a discussion about choice. And maybe we decide that there's nothing wrong with the system as is, and we want to keep pay paying and receiving care as we do today. Maybe we decide that it is okay that we pay $75,000 for a knee replacement surgery here in Alaska when we can get it for 50% cheaper someplace else. Maybe that's a choice that we make, that we're willing to continue to pay as we do today and to get care to as we do today and to maintain the current system. And that's okay. That is a choice that we can make, but there are consequences to those choices. And I actually believe that we can make a different choice. I believe that we can balance affordability with access to care and we can improve the quality of the system. I believe that our system is fragmented and broken enough that we can make changes that not only address costs but also improve access and quality. We can make the system better for the next cancer patient going through it. And it doesn't mean that we, and we can do that while restraining our cost growth. But I also know that it won't be easy. And there's no roadmap for where we want to go. I can't point to anyone else who's really figured it out. And we say, that's it. Let's adopt what they do. Let's go. So I'll save the opportunities and solutions for a later discussion. But I will say this. Change is hard. And I don't know what we want our healthcare system to look like. But if we want it to look significantly different, we have to prepare ourselves to, take some, to, make, to engage in a significant process of change. And to generate the kind of change necessary to like to really change our system, it's going to require all of us and every person that is invested in this system at different levels to undergo change. The patient is gonna to need to maybe have some different expectations. The providers are gonna to need to change the way that they practice and perhaps how they're paid. The payers are going to need to ask and to pay for things differently so that we get what they need or so that they receive um, the kind of treatment that they, that they, the providers and the patients want. To create true system change, all of us will need to be willing to change. And I can tell you, even from like, you know, changing something small in my routine, change is scary and it's hard and it's really, really difficult. It's far easier to maintain the status quo. And that's a choice we can make. But there are consequences to that choice. And those consequences are only going to become more severe. So, thank you. Thank you very much, Emily, for your personal story and for your larger story. Um, I think it's interesting, um, a couple of months ago, here for Alaska Common Ground event, we talked about the fiscal crisis here in Alaska, mm -hmm. and every single elected leader and formerly elected leader said that one of the biggest problems in terms of fixing our budget crisis is the cost of healthcare in Alaska. So I think it's an important thing that we, we ought to understand. Our next speaker will be Eric McCollum, president of the Arctic. Wire, rope, and supply. Hi, I'm just going to try to adjust this thing a little bit. Um, so I, I'm, come, I'm supposed to come at this from more from a business and a small business point of view, and and so um, you know, I, I think the one thing that I've always felt is that you need to supply, you need to have healthcare for your employees, even if you're small. And um, you know the problem with that is that it, of course ultimately I have to, it's my money I have, it's my skin in the game and so you know it, it isn't uh, you know as they say my name's on the front of the check um, you know and I, I'm also sort of held up as supposedly a, a smart entrepreneur in town and as I was trying to figure out how to uh, deal with it with the last ten years how to deal with the ongoing increase in healthcare costs you know I 
and believe me, I question that, that premise at least once a day uh, about being a, a smart entrepreneur. But, you know, I was, I was struggling with the idea, of, okay, you know, legislature's not gonna fix it. Uh, obviously, the, the business itself is not gonna fix itself because it's making too much money. And so, you know, what are my options? And so, you know, I basically just started, uh, you know, upping my deductible. So, you know, every year the deductible was higher and higher, and of course I would pay a little bit less. And then, um, you know, what I would be forced to do is think, okay, I need to self-insure my, my deductible with my employees. So I, I went as far as to say, okay, we're gonna, we're gonna go from a $500 deductible up to, a, let's say, a $2,000 deductible. I would take that $1,500 delta, and I would, I would basically self-insure that because not everybody was actually using that, that deductible. You know, and so, yeah, great, I was smart, and fine. But, you know, what happens is that the, the prices keep going up and up. And so, you know, ultimately what was happening is the, the costs were going up and the quality was going down. So in the process of trying to get cheaper and cheaper insurance, you start making, you start making um, choices. You know, and you say, well, I'm not gonna pay as much for drugs, I'm not gonna do this much for this. And so not only was the deductible going higher and higher, but just the quality of the, of the healthcare that I was offering my employees was going, uh, was, was getting worse. So, you know, trying, once again, trying to be a smart guy, you know, I went to my employees and say, okay, you're all married, you have spouses, what sort of, what sort of uh, healthcare do they have? And can you get on, if you can get on your spouse's healthcare, I will pay you money. You know, and whether it costs you nothing or whether it costs you, you know, pretty much what I, I'm paying for you now, I, I, you know, it doesn't matter, you know, it's even, even if it's a wash, you're probably going to get a better health care plan through your spouses than, than you are with me. So even if, if, if it didn't save me any money, at least I was giving my employees a better health care plan by driving them, you know, so I would basically force them. And in some cases, you know, they could get on for free and, and of course I would just write them, you know, a $400 or $500 check every month. And, and so that was, that was a raise, you know. So, you know, so there was all these little <laughs> games I was sort of having to come up with to try to, try to, try to help improve things. But then, then there's the, the other thing that, that no one really talks about here, but as an employer, guess what else I have to pay for that's tied in with healthcare? Workman's comp. And just like healthcare, which is the most expensive in the, in the world in Alaska, Workman's Comp is also the most expensive in the world because we're the most expensive in the country based on a 2012 report. Now, obviously, you all probably know what Workman's Comp is. It's an insurance form that, you know, in case my employees uh, get hurt on the job, well, then they, they you know, this, this covers it. But just like, you know, because it's the healthcare is so high, Workman's Comp is also high. So you start combining those two costs and all of a sudden for a small employer, you know, you know, it's, it's, it becomes uh, a fairly outrageous number. So we have eight employees now, we spend $100,000 uh, for eight employees. And um, so what's, I think what's really gonna happen here, because I, I'm involved with startups and I, I try to hang out with young people because they make me feel smarter or, or it, uh, <laughs> makes me feel like I'm, I'm young again or something like that. But you know, what I'm hearing a lot of is, is that you know people are saying? I mean, I, and I'm saying this too. Saying, how do I leverage technology? Because it, you know it costs too much to hire new employees. So you know I'm I'm going to figure out how to pay for it, you know either innovative equipment or innovative technology so that I can make my existing employees that much more efficient. And you know that is the best way to spend money. You know I might want to hire more people, especially at the time now when we need to hire more people because. People are getting laid off, but I'm, I'm highly disincentivized to hire humans. I, I mean, I really am. And so, but we also have to keep this in mind is as we're trying to diversify our economy, uh, because we're, you know, we all want to get off oil, let's face it, to some degree or another. And, but as we diversify our, you know, our economy, you know, it, it, we're not, we're not helping with the healthcare costs at all because people aren't going to want to, um, come up here and start businesses. I mean, I'm involved in the startup community a lot, and that's it's very romantic and very fun, but at the end of the day, you know, it's really, really hard to start a company that employs people up here. 
because of the, the amount of cost that we spend. So people are gonna start those companies elsewhere. They're not gonna start them up here. We're, we're you know, not gonna diversify our economy as quickly as we might be able to, you know, from that point of view. Or if they are gonna be up here, they're, they're gonna be looking on, very entrepreneurially at how do we, how do we innovate? How do we, how do we figure out how to make our employees, our existing employees more efficient and more productive by using technology and by using, you know, a fancy equipment? Because it's much, much cheaper. If you look at the return on investment, you know, it, it, it's dramatically different. So, I mean, I think I just, those are the kind of main points that I, I think I wanted to go away with. But you know, I always cringe every time I hear Bill Pop. No offense to Bill Pop, but every when, at AEDC he talks about how our economy is going. And guess what industry? It always goes up every every year, <laughs> and it goes up at the cost of every other industry in the state. So you know, you know, he's. We don't want an expanding, growing healthcare industry because that means the rest of us are dying. Thanks. I'm not going to opt into either of those options. I don't want to die, and I don't want to be replaced by a computer. So, sign me up for whatever other option there is, and I will and I'll appreciate that. Um, Thank you, Eric, for sharing your story and your perspective from, from a small business side. Um, and our next speaker is Mike. Mike's gonna tell a personal story as well. Uh, John tried to discourage me from using notes, but he didn't realize I was an engineer and I'm old. So bear with me with the notes and all. Um, my story starts with my wife's cancer diagnosis, which happened Earlier this year, in January, she was diagnosed with two forms of cancer. Um, there was some good news and bad news with that. The good news was uh, that the docs caught it very early. They uh, had full chance of recovery and all that. The bad news was she got diagnosed in the first place at all. But my story tonight is not really about my wife's cancer. I want to really focus on the cost aspects of the treatment that she's been receiving, uh, some of the transparency that goes with the costs that have been incurred. Um, I just took a look at the uh, Primera website before I came down here tonight. Um, the providers are in the Primera for 317,000 bucks so far this year. And we're not done and there's some monitoring that's gonna take place over some time. Um, I also wanna talk about the insurance implications and how that affects how we think about some of these things. And finally, a little bit about uh, skin in the game, whether you have skin in the game or not. And before the, I'm finished tonight, I'm going to try to throw myself under the bus and you folks can decide whether I deserve to be there or not. Um, so what's my story? Uh, my story starts with, I'm going to talk about just one aspect of our treatment. I've said that we've incurred 300,000 plus bucks so far. I'm going to talk about just the radiation treatment that um, she needed. The folks over at Providence Oncology were the ones that discovered this early. Um, they get a lot of credit for being good guys, for understanding what was going on quickly and getting us into treatment. They recommended uh, 30 treatments of radiation, which happened five days a week for about six weeks. Um, it sounded like a pretty daunting proposition, but so before we got started, I said, what's this gonna cost? And I asked the Providence folks uh, if they could give me a cost estimate. You've all probably seen the signs in the doctor's offices that say if you want a cost estimate, uh, feel free to ask. But my sense is not too many people do. So I decided to treat it like a project, like the engineer in me wants to do. And I asked Providence for a cost estimate. Uh, they initially gave me uh, kind of a skimpy estimate. They just described the procedures, uh, but they didn't give me any details. So I went back and said, can you guys give me the codes you use to, to, to define what these procedures are all about? And they ultimately did that. And when they gave me the cost estimate, um, it, it was a definitive estimate. It was in writing and it was 45,000 bucks. Well, since I am an engineer and I deal with construction projects, I said, maybe we ought to get a couple more bids on this project. <laughs> so I did. I, I was seeing a urologist in town, and the urologist has recently expanded his business. They're called Alaska Medical Specialties right now. They expanded their business to 
deal with the cancer treatment and radiation treatment specifically. So I said, well, can you guys give me an estimate? And what I did was I took the Providence estimate and I took the numbers out of it, but I gave them the description of the procedures and I gave them the cost codes and asked them to fill it out. The person I was talking to was really uncomfortable filling that out until she talked to management. And after they talked to management, they eventually came around and they said, okay, we'll fill it out. And they actually did what I asked them to do. They, I said, I was trying to get an apples to apples comparison. And, and they told me that normally they might prescribe different treatments than Providence did. And I said, well, that's fine. I don't mind you pre prescribing a different treatment, but I want an apples to apples comparison. If I like your cost, maybe I'll come do business with you and we'll decide you're the people that we want to work with. So they eventually came around to what I'd asked them to do and their cost estimate for the same treatment that Providence was recommending was 36,000 bucks. That's 9,000 bucks less than what Providence wanted. Significant difference. It's right here in town, same scope of work. Uh, same treatment process uh, for 9,000 less. And I said, okay, what would happen if I went to Seattle? And I did the same thing. I took the estimate I had, I sent it down to Virginia Mason in Seattle, which I'm sure all of you know Virginia Mason's a quality outfit, and I wanted to see what the prices would be down there. Uh, Virginia Mason's uh, did the same thing. I had to go talk to management before they could fill out the form the way I wanted them to, but they eventually came around. And they came up with a number that was uh, 32,000 bucks, $13,000 less than what Providence wanted. So I had three estimates now. We're getting ready to dive into this treatment process. And I said, what are we gonna do? I got a $32,000 estimate, I got a $36,000 estimate, and I got a $45,000 estimate. Before I tell you what we did, let me talk a little bit about the health insurance I have. Uh, I'm insured through my employer. I used to be an owner of the company, uh, like Eric, but I am now an employee, and I have uh, premier insurance as a result of my employment. I have a $3,000 deductible, I have a $10,000 out-of-pocket maximum. Um, no surprise, probably, that I reached my out-of-pocket maximum earlier this year with the big costs that we were incurring. Uh, premier actually, through their discount, has paid about 226,000 bucks to the provider so far. Um, but because I've exceeded my out-of-pocket maximum and my deductible, I got Primera paying 100% of the cost. So let's go back to the question of what did I decide to do when I had those three estimates in hand? I went with a high price spread. I did that for a number of reasons, um, but it was a little bit difficult to make that decision. But when you think about it, um, you know, Virginia Mason was remote. My wife was looking at six weeks worth of treatment and we were gonna to have to relocate down there for that time frame. So that didn't make too much sense, although I felt pretty good about those people. And I know Primera would have supported that as part of this medical uh, travel process that uh, may be able to save us all some money. Um, Alaska Medical Specialties, although their price was $9,000 less than Providence, uh, they really had just started to get into the a radiation treatment for oncology and all that. And they were a little slow getting me the estimate and we'd kind of already started with Providence. So ultimately we went with Providence. We knew the docs, um, they treated us well, they were, they were respectful, they were professional. Um, and um, the other thing I had a discussion with them about was the fact that I knew that the costs that my insurance was paying were helping subsidize the cost of other people that need treatment at Providence that don't have insurance, and Providence is required to provide that treatment to them. So some of the costs that I was incurring were helping other people get treatment also. So I said, well, okay, that's probably the best way to go for us. Um, so what, what lessons have I learned as a result of this? And, and because of the things my wife's been going through, I've kind of become a student of the healthcare process for the past year or so, and I've learned a lot of things. Um, cost transparency is available to all of us if we take the time to do it. Um, in the past six months, we passed a rule here in the municipality that says uh, you can get at cost estimates for the services if you ask for it, and you've all seen the notices in the doctor's offices that offer that. Um, 
So as for the cost estimates, realize that they'll probably come with a bunch of disclaimers. I don't think the docs have quite figured out exactly how to give us current fixed price costs for our construction projects or your radiation projects, if you will. Um, but they're getting better. And if any of you were here at the last session of this group, there was a handout that was provided that talked about how to deal with costs. Uh, I thought it was very helpful. Uh, I thought it was a nice piece of work and I've kind of taken that to heart and learned some things by doing that. The other thing I learned here is the insurance um, that we may have stifles our individual responsibility for costs. Um, this is where I'm gonna throw myself under the bus. I went to the high price spread. I did that because I didn't have any skin in the game. I had my uh, out-of-pocket costs paid. Insurance was covering, or Premier was covering 100% of the cost. And I was free to go anywhere I wanted to, which kind of surprised me. They didn't try to influence that one way or the other. So I did, went with the $45,000 cost. And consequently, as a result, result of that, all of us that do things like that, we don't have any real responsibility for the cost. We don't put any pressure on the providers and we don't cause the providers to think twice about what they're charging us for these things. So that's one of the big lessons I learned that if we don't take more actions on our own, these costs are gonna to continue to rise until we demand more transparency. Maybe we take advantage of medical tourism and we just find a way to have a little more skin in the game. And I have uh, the ultimate solution to this thing. Uh, I had a letter to the editor published a couple months ago in the newspaper. There's an article that Ross Douthat in the New York Times wrote <laughs> called Make America Singapore. I took a look at that and I said, well, maybe we ought to make Alaska Singapore. Singapore has a, uh, a health plan that uh, requires employers and employees both to mandatorily contribute to health savings plans they use those health savings plans to pay for their day-to-day -day health care. So the individual uh, has skin in the game and is really paying attention to their costs a little more. And they have a single payer system to cover the catastrophic things like what my wife ran into. So uh, if you get a chance, Google Make America Singapore. You can find the article and it's pretty interesting reading and maybe it's the solution for Alaska and America. Anyway, thank you. Mike, I know you say that you're an engineer, but I've got to believe that there's maybe a little bit of a lawyer in you being so persistent with paperwork. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> being one, I know that it's not any fun, so hanging out with them has got to be even worse. Uh, our next presenter, and by the way, uh, if you're looking for the handout that Mike was discussing, Kari has, we have copies of that handout, so you too can go get price comparisons. Uh, our next speaker is actually a medical doctor, Dr. Alan Gross. I'm actually a doctor. Uh, Cliff asked uh, how an orthopedic surgeon uh, could get involved in healthcare reform. So I guess that's my story. And I'm not a status quo guy, as you'll find out. Uh, my story begins, I was born and raised in Juneau uh, in 1962. And back when I grew up, the state had more money coming in than we knew what to do with. My dad was the state attorney general under Governor Jay Hammond for seven years. And I remember as a teenager going duck hunting with Jay and my dad on our boat uh, for a three or four day duck hunting trip where they sat around talking about form uh, formation of the permanent fund for the majority of the trip. So they were different days back then. And I loved hunting and fishing. I grew up spending a lot of time in the outdoors. Uh, through some friends that I'd met uh, through competitive swimming in Petersburg, I gravitated into commercial fishing, and I started fishing when I was 15, and over the next eight summers, I fished throughout the state, Bristol Bay, Gulf of Alaska, Southeast, and a number of different fisheries. I owned two different commercial fishing boats of my own, and I ended up fishing for four months off the northern shore of Norway for cod when I took a year off after high school. And I talk about my commercial fishing days because it made a big impression on me as far as the value of a hard day's work. And I also learned that I liked to use my hands and I was good with using my hands. And because I liked working with people and helping people, I chose to go into healthcare. Uh, 
So I worked, uh, I put myself through college and medical school. I went through the WAMI program, the University of Washington. Uh, I met my wife, Monica, uh, in Seattle. She's also a physician. And we did our residencies in Ann Arbor, University of Michigan. She's a pediatrician. And, um, and when we finished, uh, we came back to Alaska, or I came back to Alaska, she wasn't from here. Uh, but it was always very important for me to come home. And it was, I looked around at other parts of the state seriously, but I ended up uh, returning back to Juneau and, um, and practiced there. And when I came back to Juneau, uh, at first I practiced in solo private practice for eight years uh, in the practice administered by myself. And things got very, very busy, and it was sort of a now or never moment with my uh, family, and we chose to take a two-year sailing sabbatical. We sailed from Juneau to Auckland, New Zealand, and then back to Juneau. And along the course of the trip, I did a small sports, me sports medicine fellowship in Auckland, and I participated in and experienced a number of international healthcare systems along the way. When I got back to Juneau, I went back into solo private practice for two years, but this time in a practice administered by the hospital rather than by myself. And then I became the lead organizer and uh, force behind the organization of Juneau Bone and Joint Center, which is a five-person orthopedic surgery or orthopedic surgeon subspecialty group in Juneau. Uh, not on, uh, um, we had x-ray, MRI, um, physical therapy, and now a small surgery center. And Juno Bone and Joint Center was and still is a monopoly, uh, not unlike a number of healthcare facilities up here in Anchorage. Anyway, I worked there for nine years. I was elected as president in its first year when we formed the, uh, um, the corporation, and then after that, it became a rotating position. And in 2013, I decided to change gears and I became a part-time employee of Petersburg Medical Center, which is a hospital in Petersburg. Uh, for those of you that aren't familiar with Petersburg, it's a community of about 3,000 people, primarily a commercial fishing town south of Juneau. When I first came back to Juneau, I was understandably concerned that there wouldn't be enough business for a new person to come back to town. And I was on good terms with the other physicians in town and I was getting ready to offer to uh, scrub on an operation and one of my senior colleagues was with me and I asked him um, is there room for another guy here and he smiled and he put his arm on my shoulder and he said son this here is the golden goose you're going to be just fine and of course he was right it was and still is and as the months went by and remember I was administering my own practice at that time so I was seeing everything. And as the checks and the EOB started coming in and I realized that I was being paid three to five times the national average of my colleagues that were equally trained, uh, I became very interested in healthcare economics and trying to understand why there was such a massive discrepancy between what we were paid here uh, versus down south. And I ran into a senior billing manager that I'd known for many years. She didn't work for me. And I said, how can this be? What's behind this? And she said, I don't know, but there's a ton of money on the table and you'd be a fool not to take it. Everyone else is. And so that's what we've all been doing up here, really. Um, and let me just say that the vast majority of the doctors that I've met uh, in Alaska and elsewhere and other healthcare professionals at hospitals are really good people. And I would say that the majority of us went into healthcare for the right reasons. I certainly did. I wanted to help people and I wanted to come home and share that with people I grew up with. But I think that we all know that money has a tendency to corrupt and there's been a lot of money on the table. And in my opinion, it's a system that's corrupt, not the people. And it's a system that needs to be changed. And as time went by, I became progressively disillusioned with the way we deliver healthcare in Alaska and in the country, partly because of my experiences in other places. And I saw a great deal of greed and envy. I saw a lot of backstabbing and infighting. I saw excessive self-referral, um, overutilization, and it got to the point where I really wasn't enjoying practicing orthopedic surgery uh, the way I was doing it anymore. And so I decided to make a change. So Monica and I, excuse me, Monica and I went back to school, and we went to UCLA. 
she had other interests, uh, but mine were primarily uh, healthcare economics, and we both got master's degrees in public health in 2013 and 2014, and this is after I had become an employee of Petersburg Hospital, so I commuted back and forth between Southern California and Petersburg to work. And when we finished the program, uh, we moved back to Petersburg, and since then, uh, in addition to working part-time at Petersburg Medical Center, I work about six weeks there a year doing clinics and surgery. Um, I also volunteer internationally at a pediatric children's orthopedic hospital in Phnom Penh, Cambodia once a year, and it's been an amazing experience. Um, and because once it gets in your blood, it's kind of hard to shake. I got back into commercial fishing in 2013, and I own a 40 foot gill netter and fish Southeast Alaska for salmon with one or more of my family members in the summer. And then of course I've gotten into healthcare reform. And in addition to being part of these Alaska Common Ground talks, I'm also on the Alaska State Medicaid Commission for cost and quality. Uh, some of you may know me as an outspoken advocate for a single payer, it's a single payer system in Alaska or national. Um, and, I, and while I was fishing this summer, I was approached by a number of individuals who asked me to become the campaign chairman and lead spokesperson for the two Alaska healthcare ballot initiatives that are, are currently circulating around the state with uh, obtaining signatures. <clears throat> um, you know, I, I think Alaska is in a severe fiscal crisis right now. I think we all know that. Uh, I thought it was 2.5 billion, but I guess it's 3.2 billion now. It's a deficit that our legislature can't make up. Small businesses really don't want to add new employees because of the tremendous cost, and new businesses will avoid the state at all costs because we have by far the highest healthcare premiums in the world. You all probably heard about Amazon looking for new headquarters, and there's no way they'd ever move to Alaska because of the healthcare costs. Um, you know, I think some of you may consider me uh, a hypocrite for having profited off the system, and I certainly did, but I didn't come to Alaska for that reason. And, and to be honest, I didn't understand the healthcare and economics at all when I came back here. What was important to me was coming back to Alaska and uh, raising my family here, um, providing care for people that I grew up with, and more than anything, I want my kids and their kids to have the same opportunities that I had growing up in Alaska. And I truly believe that Alaska is not gonna be able to pull out of its economic tailspin until we can figure out how to contain the prices of healthcare in Alaska. And for me, it came down to a decision of wanting to be uh, part of the solution rather than perpetuating the problem. So that's how I got involved with healthcare reform. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gross. And, um, you know, I, I want to say that you're a good person because you're a good person, but I believe that part of that is also because you're a Michigan Wolverine. Go blue. Thank you. Uh, our next presenter is Moira, Moira Gallagher, and uh, she's from the Anchorage Economic Development Corporation, so maybe she can share some thoughts with Bill later. <laughs> Well, indeed, my name is Moira Gallagher, and I work for the Anchorage Economic Development Corporation. Uh, but don't worry, Eric, I will not be cribbing Bill's speech about uh, the, the wondrous growth of the healthcare industry. Uh, I have a different topic entirely. So I'm the director of the Live, Work, Play initiative at the Anchorage Economic Development Corporation. Um, and I'll get into that a little bit later. What that means is I talk about millennials a lot. <laughs> really a lot, probably more than most people in this room have talked about millennials in their lives combined. Millennials are the largest generation in American history. And I'm gonna say that again, because oftentimes I say that to baby boomers and they don't believe me. Millennials are the largest generation in American history. Baby boomers, all told, 76 million. Millennials, 84 million. 
If you think that the graying of Alaska with the baby boom generation has had a significant impact on cost and demand for healthcare, just wait until the millennials arrive. Except the millennials have already arrived. I know a lot of us like to think of millennials as just kids. But aside from the last 24 months of life, which will be your most expensive, regardless of who you are, there is one other time in your life when you are expected to incur healthcare costs, even remotely approaching what you will incur at end of life. Anybody want to take a guess? When that is? Yeah, big hint right here. Yes. <laughs> So this is where my personal and my professional life intersect because maternity costs are, again, second to end of life, the most expensive healthcare costs you will incur in your life. And it's different in different states and it's of course different across the world what you will experience. Here in Alaska, the 50th percentile, so the median take home cost of delivering a baby at the hospital with zero complications, by that I mean no C-section, no episiotomy, no epidural, the median take-home cost after insurance is $9,000. After insurance. The 75th percentile of labor and delivery costs in the state of Alaska is $15,000. That means a quarter of women who get pregnant and have children in the state of Alaska are paying more than you would for a decent mid-sized car just to take the baby home from the hospital. So forget about trying to save for college tuition, right? Forget about that down payment that you saved to buy a new house for your little one. Forget about buying a new, safer car. I don't know about you, but I don't know a lot of 31-year-olds who have $15,000 in cash lying around, and between nine and 15 is what you could reasonably expect to have to pay out of pocket after insurance simply to bring the baby home from the hospital. Why would you worry about this if you are not a childbearing age? Perhaps those days are behind you, or perhaps you don't intend to have children, so this isn't actually going to have a huge impact on you. And so this is where I tell you where my professional and my personal lives collide on a constant basis. <laughs> Through the Anchorage Economic Development Corporation, my job as the director of the Live Work Play Initiative is to identify obstacles to Anchorage becoming the best possible city that we can be and really achieving its maximum economic potential. So I spend a lot of time looking at other cities nationally and globally that are successfully growing economically, that are attracting new industries, that are bringing new businesses, uh, and, of, and of course just experiencing job growth. And overwhelmingly, what cities that are attracting new businesses are doing first and doing most successfully is attracting young, hungry, talented people. They're attracting millennials. They're building cities that have fabulous quality of life. Because in a global economy, business chases talent and talent chases place. So if you are a talented member of the workforce, you have your pick of where you wanna live. Because in the global economy, companies will move to where you are. They can be located anywhere in the world. We were just talking about Amazon's HQ2. Amazon was looking anywhere in the US there were a whole bunch of factors that they cared about, but really high on that list was quality of life. And of course, healthcare is one of those factors. How do you attract and retain the best possible, highly qualified, talented workforce when your healthcare costs are as astronomical as they are for us now? And they are not just astronomical for the seniors who are having knee replacements or cancer treatments or any kind of end of life care. They're really expensive for people like me. Last week I had a very exciting appointment. It was my ultrasound appointment where I got to find out with my husband the sex of our baby. Very exciting. It was also a very important appointment because this is the ultrasound where the doctor will scan the entire body's baby and decide if there are any anatomical anomalies. And thank God we have a very healthy, wonderful baby. We're very happy. And this was exciting, it was exciting to us to find out the sex of the baby. It was a lot less exciting to walk out to the front lobby of the medical office and find out that after insurance, we owed $650 for our ultrasound. 
This is not included in the $9,000 cost of maternity care, labor, and delivery at the hospital. So just think about all the things that add up along the way over the course of nine months before the baby even gets here. And of course, I tell my friends about this, and my friends, some of them say, I wonder if I even want to have kids after all. But more of them say, I wonder if I should move out of Alaska before I start having kids. And those are people who are so talented, and those are people who have so much that they could give to Alaska. And if those people leave because they simply can't afford to push a baby out the birth canal at Providence Hospital, that's a huge loss for our economy. Millennials are looking for cities that have all sorts of amenities, especially educated, college-educated, talented millennials, but really all over the place. They're looking to move to a place where they're going to have a sense of belonging. They want great schools, they want parks and playgrounds, urban amenities like downtown restaurants and live entertainment and outdoor recreation. These are a lot of the things that I spend much of my day working on helping make Anchorage better at. We could be better. We could, we could do a lot better. Many of the fastest growing cities in America for millennials are actually winter cities, which I think is fascinating. Bozeman, Montana, Boise, Idaho, and Boulder, Colorado are two of the most attractive, or three of the most attractive cities for millennials right now. So anyone who tells you that Anchorage can't be because it's too cold or too dark, kick them out of your party. They don't belong there. <laughs> but the truth is that if Anchorage wants to bring new businesses online and attract new types of industries here, then we would have to attract the talent first. And we're not gonna be able to attract that talent, particularly young people, when the expenses for the sorts of things that happen to you in your younger years are as high as they are. That talent is keenly aware of how much healthcare costs here. So as millennials enter into this period of their life with the second highest healthcare costs, they're paying very close attention. They're paying attention to how many employers offer really good health insurance. They're paying attention to how high their premiums are and how high their deductible is. And at this stage in their life, they're paying attention to how much it will cost in Alaska compared to anywhere else in the country to simply bring a baby home from the hospital. We can't afford to hemorrhage our talent any longer. Alaska has suffered from brain drain for a long time, but because of the success of the resource extraction industries, we've been able to more or less bring up as many new people as we lose and sometimes more. And oftentimes those people will actually stick around and plant roots and grow a family here. But that is not our reality now. Our reality is that we have to understand that what's causing Alaska to be expensive is so much dependent on healthcare. And the answer is not, it is not, well, it's just Alaska, that's the way it is. And here's the way I know that. Because, like my friend Mike over here, I also did my research. 20 years ago, the cost of labor and delivery in the state of Alaska was between 10 and 12% higher than the national average. Today, at $9,000 for a median, plain vanilla delivery, it is more than twice the national average. That happened over the last 20 years. That is not inflation, that is not a national healthcare problem, that is an Alaska healthcare problem. It doesn't have to be that way. We can't afford for it to be that way. Year after year, we're going to lose our best and brightest because they can't afford the cost of healthcare and they simply can't afford the cost of having babies. We can do better. Thanks. It's a boy. <laughs> Congratulations. And, um, you know, there's there's a link that Moira and I have. We're both storytellers on this stage when we talked about the things that attract people to come back to Alaska. Moira is one of two women that I know whose names start with an M. Morgan Kristen is the other. Uh, I had never lived in Alaska before I moved up here. Morgan Kristen brought me up and said she was going to keep me. Almost eight years later, she did not lie. Um, Moira got a city slicking New Yorker to move up to Alaska. So women with them names, please continue to make Alaska a little bit better. Uh, and our last speaker for this evening is Erin Friel. I'd like to say thank you to Helen for letting me know about this great series and uh, thank you to Cliff and thank you John for putting this all together and making it so awesome. Um, I want to tell you the story of a boy, okay? This little boy was so much wanted that his mom 
walked away from a nine year high speed military analyst career in intelligence right after 9-11 because I knew as his mother that I was not gonna be able to raise him the way that I wanted to as a part-time warfighter. I left the service and this little boy was so treasured and he was so bright and he toddled around the house. And of course, every parent thinks that their child's the best, right? But no, 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 Connor, my Connor <laughs> is the best. But then we moved to Korea. You know, we moved all around the world, but we moved to Korea and the tradition in Korea, among the military families, is you spend all day, every summer day, at the base pool. You walk a mile, you go and you let your kids go nuts for six hours, you walk the mile home, everybody's tired, everybody eats their hamburgers, everybody goes to bed. That's the tradition. And Connor was nine that summer, and uh, it started coming, you know, on the way home. He'd say, Mama, I'm just so tired so tired and I said well yeah we just swam for six hours at the pool of course you're tired yeah and then by July it was mama my, my legs hurt I, I don't want to be at the pool today so we'd leave after three hours and all the eyes would watch us go and then and then we started to round about August have tears Mama, I can't walk that far. Now, Korea is a walking culture. My car battery died on a regular basis because I just never drove. Everywhere you can walk, you walk in Korea. And there's mass transit. And of course, they all weigh about 15 pounds because everybody walks. And I'm carrying a nine-year-old whose, whose feet hang down to here on me around the base. And I'm taking him to doctor after doctor. And they're telling me, oh, it's growing pains. It's summer, he's active. But I gotta tell you, I've been in military intelligence for nine years. Nobody can Google like a worried mother. <laughs> and I knew, I knew in my heart there was something wrong. And I finally convinced the pediatrician to let me take him to a rheumatologist. And we, we went there <coughs> and I knew walking in the door, I knew walking in the door what it was going to be. And the, uh, the doctor looked at me and he says, your son has arthritis. I just don't know what kind yet. People probably aren't really aware that kids can get arthritis. And when kids get arthritis, it's not grandma and grandpa's inky knees or hips. It is a full-blown, lifelong, incurable disorder that your entire body turns on the joints and your eyes and your internal organs and attacks them relentlessly. It is intensely painful, intensely fatiguing, and only manageable with very expensive drugs. So I, I, I knew it was walking in the door, but it was still a blow. You know, there's my nine-year-old hugging his knees to his chest and screaming in pain. And I knew, but it's still a blow. We, uh, we walked out of there after a very efficient Korea hospital experience. And um, a week later we came back and they wanted him immediately on long-term chemotherapy. They suppressed the immune system in hopes that it'll stop attacking the body. They wanted immediately on an expensive anti-inflammatory and uh, then they were like, you're gonna need physical therapy and by the way, you might wanna buy a wheelchair. And uh, <clears throat> we were insulated from a lot of the worst of it um, because we were living in Korea and we literally knew no one who had arthritis. We didn't know other kids that had arthritis. Uh, I asked the Korean doctor, you know, are there Korean kids that have arthritis? He goes, yeah, like three. <laughs> There's 300,000, by the way, in the United States. So when we found out we were moving back to Alaska, we've been Alaskan citizens for 10 years. We were super excited. And we found out that the arthritis community is actually pretty robust up here. And the reason why is arthritis is really high in Alaska. The juvenile arthritis rate in Alaskan native children is seven times higher than it is in the Caucasian population. 
So we actually have a pretty robust system. They have doctors that fly up from Seattle to see the kids up here. They have camps for them. They have conferences for them. They, they really do try to support these children. Um, but that was my introduction to American healthcare. Um, I've been insulated for a year. You know, when I got my explanation of benefits in Korea, uh, in MRI, genetic studies, x-rays, blood work, a specialist visit, and medication walking out the door cost me $633. <clears throat> that gets me in the door with the specialist, and that's about it here in Alaska. Now, the crappy thing about arthritis, there's a lot of crappy things about arthritis, but um, the treatments are temporary, and they are expensive. They are actually the most expensive drugs on the market. They're known as biologics. So once you move past the point that chemotherapy helps you, and Connor moved pretty quickly past that point, you get into biologics. And he started with uh, Humira. Humira is a very painful shot to get. He'd scream in anticipation that he was gonna get this shot. It's also very expensive. So the insurance was charged 4,500. They paid 1763 for a month worth of biologics. <clears throat> I have great healthcare through the military. So um, once we paid that first thousand dollars of the deductible, we were okay, you know. I, I, but I did start paying attention to these things. Um, you know, Humera failed Connor pretty quickly to the point that, you know, I'm sitting on the floor with a screaming child who's saying, Mama, why won't you let me die? You need to let me die. And I said, buddy, come on, hold on. We're gonna get you Enbrel. We're gonna move on to the next thing. It's not over. We moved to Enbrel. That too is a $4,800 drug. And uh, they again paid about $1,760 per month for that. And unfortunately, Enbrel failed Connor pretty fast. Connor has a severe polyarticular type of juvenile idiopathic arthritis, which is a big mouthful of saying, hey, by the way, this is completely incurable and remission's probably not gonna happen for you, okay? And uh, now he's moved on to Remicade. I looked at Remicade and researched it early, <clears throat> and it costs anywhere from $14,000 to $16,000 per month at an infusion center treated at a cancer center. It's a full day sitting there with an IV and getting steroids and all sorts of things to suppress your immune system enough to even take the drug. And uh, it's been working well enough that, you know, we haven't had cries for death. He has his good days and his bad days. He limps, he has a hard time, he can't run, he can't play like a normal child. Um, and military spouses are not by nature political. We usually focus our efforts on uh, military spouse issues for the most part. We're kind of encouraged to stay in our lane, if you will. <laughs> but this summer, uh, in this spring, I met a lot of arthritis children that were going untreated because of these costs. I met a child who was diagnosed at the same age as Connor and was now 16 and had permanent deformations where his hands are curled in on themselves and are completely unusable. I met a child who went blind because the arthritis had settled in her eyes and her parents couldn't afford treatment. I met children who were in wheelchairs and were going to stay there for the next 60 years because their parents couldn't afford these miraculous drugs that are keeping my son up and walking. And then Don Young happened. Don Young went ahead and passed a health care repeal and I wrote an op-ed in the ADN where I said, I want Don Young to look my son in the face and I want Don Young to tell my son that his life is worth less. Because you know what? My son is gonna age off of my insurance. At some point, my son, 26, is going to have to go find his own insurance. And I can tell you it won't be in Alaska. And someday my son may have to choose between rent and medicine. My son may have to choose between healthy food and going to the doctor this month. And I want Don Young to tell him that that choice is okay. <coughs> and the vitriol that I actually received from that opinion piece was eye-opening. Um, 
I had multiple people tell me it was natural selection, that this was my genetics at fault and that I should let my son die. Um, I had multiple people have a wild misunderstanding of military benefits. Um, I didn't know that for life, you know, I was set up like, <laughs> like Croesus, rich sitting on my pile of gold because of our military service. <laughs> and I had one gentleman tell me that the best thing that Alaska could do is implement a euthanasia program. <clears throat> I had lots of supportive comments too, but that was the moment at which I said, oh my gosh, I need to understand healthcare. I need to be able to reach out and I need to be able to touch these Alaskan children who have unusable hands, who are blind now, because they weren't lucky enough to be born into a family where the mom could quit the job and homeschool so that he could get a good education still, despite those days of God awful pain. And you know, have the entire house revolve and set out around, is Connor having a good day? Is Connor having a bad day? Let's accommodate with physical therapy. Let's hire him a music teacher that's gonna teach him computer programming so he can t continue to play the music he loves so much when his hands will no longer work. I have an incredibly lucky son, but there are Alaskan children who are not in the same position. And so I just want to reach out to you and I want to say like, if your parents or you can even picture yourself at a point where you're sitting in the sloppiest pair of pajamas you can imagine and you're rocking a nine year old on your chest and he's saying, mama, just let me die. Don't let that be a truth for 3000 Alaskan children. And let's help solve this now. sharing your story and thank you to all of our storytellers. I, I think one of the inherent story kind of highlights this um, for me uh, is that one of the things that is really important about sharing our stories and talking with one another and coming out on cold nights to a bar to listen to other people tell stories is that we have to understand our shared humanity. And I think that one of the things that's really cool about Alaskans is that we often do help each other out. And this is one of those issues where for too long we haven't done that. And maybe it's time that we take some care to understand what's going on and how we can help one another out to resolve these problems and understand that each of us as Alaskans deserve better. So uh, thank you all for taking the time to come to this event. We hope that you'll support Alaska Common Ground if you've enjoyed this event or other events. Um, please provide donations or become a member of Alaska Common Ground. We will have two other um, two other events for certain on the healthcare cost situation. The next one will be on Wednesday, December December thirteenth, uh, here at Forty Ninth State. And thank you, Forty Ninth State, for uh, helping us host these events. Um, and that will be on the causes of healthcare, high healthcare costs. And then Wednesday, January tenth, um, we will talk about some of the potential solutions. And if we need another night for solutions, then we'll take that. And I think all the speakers um, are pretty amenable to people coming up and asking questions. So if you have any questions, please just hang around, uh, buy, buy them a soda or a drink or, you know, I don't, no, no drinks for Moira, but everyone else I think is free and clear if they, whatever other liquids they want. And thank you guys all very, very much and have a good, good night.